I want to point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. I'm George Harvey. This is Tom Fennell. We have two guests, one of whom is James Perkins, who is over here, and at the end is Jeffrey. I have forgotten your last Dickinson. name. Dickinson. Dickinson. May, maybe I didn't know your last name. Anyway, they come from, a, from a, an organization called Little Green Hydro, which does microhydro, strangely enough. And first, we're going to go through the news, and uh, just uh, the reminder of the, of the rules here is that anybody can say anything anytime they want. So that's how we do it. Um, starting on the 28th of February, I saw uh, this news, the um, Tesla. It says they're in investing $5 billion in the world's largest battery factory, and they want to cut the cost of batteries by 30%. Now, these batteries include batteries for um, for the power grids and for home backup. This is this is not just <coughs> uh, automotive batteries. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what effect that has, because it will have an effect on people's ability to deal with solar. Um, also the same day, we, we got a, a thing saying an accident waiting to happen. Huge amounts of oil are being transported by rail out of shale oil fields, and the the likelihood of a of a a um, an accident is almost a hundred percent. The likelihood of the oil being recovered when it's spilled is almost zero percent. And this comes from a, from a publication called Resilience. You can get to these these items that I'm talking about, by the way, by going to my website, which is geoharvey.wordpress.com and look at the 28th of, of February and those two articles are there. Tom is being extremely quiet. Well, I was just trying to get this picture <laughs> of the oil, the oil pipeline. Oh yeah, is. look at this. There you go. There's <laughs> that, a picture. That train's 100 cars long. Well, 100 cars, I mean, you, we used to see trains that were 180 cars well, long. Well, it might, be, more, it might <laughs> be 180, it's long. Yeah. You derail that train, you're gonna have a mess on your hands. And I found out, by this, I think it was the same article, that in at least one of these instances, that train, or one very much like it, has to go through Glacier Park. Oh, good. Up one side of the mountain and down the other. Yeah. I and I've what, seen the what, train what, in Glacier Park. You know, they have glacier sheds and stuff like this. this it's scary that, that that stuff's going through Glacier Park. So if this spills in Glacier Park and it gets into a glacier, it's just kind of stuck there. Uh, I think so. It, there's, there's no way of getting it out. Yeah, that's probably the case. Well, here's a couple. The grizzly bears won't like it. The grizzly bears won't like it. Here's a couple of pieces that, that uh, come together. They, they, these arrived on the 1st of, of March. The first one is from Energy Trends Insider. Natural gas inventories are headed towards zero. Um, we have already withdrawn 2.4 trillion cubic feet of natural gas from inventories. We are likely four to six weeks away from the bottom. At this pace, the inventory will reach zero the week of March 28th. That is zero natural gas, which of course is not good for people who are dependent on natural gas. The second of these two articles is from Fierce Energy. Genscape is re reporting that renewable generation was up 30% for the week ending February 20th, while gas consumption plummeted 35% as a result of the increase in renewables and weaker power demand. You're being very quiet. Come on. I'm, I'm trying to concentrate here. <laughs> some, Poor some, Tom has got Something is amiss on that screen there, and I'm trying to figure out how to straighten it out. <laughs> Poor Tom has to pay attention to two things at once, one of which is, is re renewable energy and energy and global warming, and the other of which is operating <laughs> the laptop. <laughs> okay. Um, this, is, this is an interesting combination because it means that it may be that we were headed towards zero 
for the for the natural gas inventories, but we're going to get saved by by wind and solar, and um, hydro, and um, whatever else can come along. Next, same day from Think Progress, when heat waves racked Australia at the start of the year, driving up electricity demand, the presence of wind power in the country actually kept electricity costs 40% lower than they otherwise would have been, according to a new study. I don't know how much comment that requires, but um, there it is. It's a similar story. On the 2nd of March, we heard this. The number of very hot days has soared in the past 15 years, according to a study from the journal Nature Climate Change Reports. Uh, a study from NASA agrees, and one from the World Meteorological Organization puts the increase at 500%. And this was in Energy Collective. This is, this is disturbing. You know, I mean, we, we've, we've been had, having climate change deniers saying, oh, it's all been, it's all, it's all, there has been no climate change in the last 15 years, and they're reporting a 500% increase in hot days. <laughs> that sounds like an increase to me. I, I can't believe these people don't know what's going on. There's some very smart people, and they employ some very smart people. Who, and so so they're, they're disinforming us for their own particular I reasons. I think that's probably the case. I think basically there's a lot of fossil fuel in the ground that they got on the books for enormous sums. We're yeah. talking billions hundreds of billions probably trillions. that are going to be worthless if they can't get them out of the ground. Well, that's the and if we got to start cutting back, their bottom line is going to suffer severely. It's a big issue in Europe right now with the European oil companies looking at the at the reserves they have on their books and and, and wondering if, if the carbon tax comes along how much that's going to drop the value of, of, of their books. Exactly. But also just if, if at some point in, in the future that 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 oil becomes unpumpable, then these companies essentially will collapse. So in, in Europe, there's a large, very heated discussion going on now about well, oil companies. That very issue. Of, you know, we're, talking, the ground, we're saying they, exactly the same really thing in different worthwhile. words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the European banks are saying that the American oil companies are going to collapse too. I, I, yes. Yeah. It's it's just, we're not this immune is to not that. A, yet. Not a joke. Anybody with that kind of. And one of the things that bothers me about it is the the pressures that I see building on this stuff are going to affect a lot of people. And a lot of people are going to get hurt. And I'm talking about people who haven't invested in oil or haven't invested in, in, um, in uh, fracking or whatever, but people who are dependent on natural gas, people who are dependent on gasoline for cars, things of that nature. I want to get through this as quickly as I can so I can get to Little Green Hydra. Um, according to Ethan Zindler of Bloomberg, energy finance, recent price declines for solar have been massive while merely substantial for wind, but it means that a global shift away from fossil fuels is no longer, quote, theoretical, end quote. This was in Clean Technica. Um, and I think, you know, this just reinforces the, the same message that we've been having all along. It, it's interesting to me to see that at this point, Renewable power is, in fact, um, hitting uh, grid parity. Uh, same day, a centerpiece of Germany's new energy agenda is a relaunch of the Energiewende. That rhymes. <laughs> An ambitious project launched in 2003 to produce investments in renewable energy. In the new plan, renewable energy targets remain ambitious. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Again, it's something that I think is very badly reported in the United States. People don't know that most of the renewable energy in, the, in Germany, which is, which is causing people's bills to go up, belongs to individual families, farms, and so forth. And the, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing 40% of the people in Germany have seen their power bills substantially cut by the energy vendor, which is why it is supported by the overwhelming majority of the population. Okay, um, on the fourth, this is something that I find really kind of interesting. Physicists at Harvard University of Engineering and Applied Scientists envision a device that can harvest energy from the Earth's infrared emissions into outer space. I read that and I'm blown away. I, I'm blown away. It's like <laughs> this is like backwards solar. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's like backwards solar. It's like it's it's yeah. 
It's, it's as counterintuitive as, as the idea of getting heat from the outside air, which is at 10 below zero, although people do that all the mm -hmm. time. Recent technology advances can, can transform the heat imbalance into DC power. I have no idea how it works, folks. Jeff, do you, do you it's have It's a black a, box, and they put smoke in there. I, 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 I'm glad you explained it. German utility RWE posted its first net loss in 60 years, down 2.8 billion euros for, nine, for 2013, following a 4.8 billion of, uh, a write off for the conventional power pl plant fleet. The operating result of renewables division of RWE was up 7% to 196 million euros. And that's the interesting part. The yeah. renewables part's making money. Yeah. The conventional part's part losing. Is losing money. Yeah. Well, I, you know, this goes with everything that I've heard so far. On the, th on the 5th of March, I got this piece. The U.S. Secretary of Energy Ernest Monitz says he expects wind, solar, and other renewables to make up 30 to 40 percent of the of the country's energy mix by 2030. He says of nuclear power in the United States, quote, the long-term traje traje trajectory uh, remains quite uncertain, end quote. And that again. I, I think his figures are low for renewables. I think it's going to be much, much more than 20, 30 to 40 percent by 2030. I'm figuring, huh? I was going to say interesting that in the 20th century, in the mid 1920s, when electricity was fairly new, I don't know the exact number. That I think is an interesting, um, interesting development. They, they don't have enough people. They need to train them. And I'm sure we don't either. I have no doubt of it. I know that, you know, I know that uh, in some places, people, for example, who have lost jobs in coal mines are starting to work as, um, as, as maintenance people and installers for wind turbines, such what. But, you know, we're, we're living in a time of change. And oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's heavy duty change. And I think a lot of people would find it more comfortable not to, not to change. On the 6th, today is the 6th, isn't it? We're up to today. Five reasons solar's win over gas in Minnesota is just the beginning. That's, this is an opinion piece. If solar trumps gas for peaking power plants in Minnesota, there's little reason to be building new natural gas peaking capacity anywhere in the country ever again. This is from Clean Technica. The five points, very briefly, solar wins on cost, solar contracts can be long-term contracts at low cost. Solar wins on predictability because it has non-volatile prices. Solar wins on reliability. Load reliability is better because it's closer to demand. This is a matter of distributed power and the value of distributed power. It's up there on the screen, by the way. Ah, there it is. Um, solar wins on infrastructure by reducing need where gas increases it. That is to say, because it's distributed, you don't need as much infrastructure to deliver it to the to the customers. Where with gas, you've got to build pipelines. Yeah, you know, the gas is here. You want the power over there. You got to either get the power from there to here, or the gas from here to there. Or you can move everybody. You can say we're putting in a three gorges dam. You've got to. <laughs> <laughs> And, so, and fifth, but not least. solar wins on economic benefits. And just one of the benefits the article talks about is that it has eight times as many jobs as a, as a gas facility with the same uh, power output. And I, that, I think, is true of most of the, uh, of the uh, renewable energy uh, uh, schemes because they they're smaller, they're distributed, and so they hire more people per the, for the amount of power. But even so, they're less expensive, or getting to be less expensive, one or the other. So if there's a message out there for people who are watching this that are looking for work, <laughs> figure out some way to get involved with solar. Yeah, well, I or think, I think renewables beyond that. I mean, you made, oh, a, you made a good point. The, the, the beauty of, of renewables, really, is that they are small and they are decentralized. Right. So by being small and decentralized, you're creating more jobs in more places. So I don't understand why, why politicians haven't picked up on that point that renewables, well, it's, including it's a, hydro. It's a know, really good point. And, creates jobs, and creates it's not skill just, jobs. It's not just jobs. It's yeah. also security. 
if we had a system for Brattleboro or Putney or or Montpelier, where where there's a microgrid or mini grids that are that are detachable. When Hurricane Irene comes around, you can detach it, you can get it going, you can have Brattleboro up and running in a matter of hours where it might take the grid days. Oh, much greater energy. It's true energy independence. True energy independence. And not only that, distributed power means you can keep the money in town. And the economic benefit of that is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Brattleboro spends $24 million a year on electricity. This is the, the various organizations, the municipality, the mm -hmm. businesses, the people. It comes out of everybody's pocket. That money is put into a, into a pipeline that runs directly to wherever it's going, yeah, but it, it isn't it's in awkward. Vermont. It yeah, defies right. gravity. <laughs> it defies <laughs> gravity. And if we had, if we had our, our energy supply based on renewable energy, that money would stay in town. What do you suppose people in Brattleboro would do with $24 million yeah, a year? Right. Right. Probably spend it. And you know what? Locally. Yeah, they probably <laughs> spend it locally. Yeah. The interesting thing is that's just the electricity. That doesn't count the heat. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Which is another 20 some odd million dollars. And by the way, I got those figures from Paul Cameron, who is the town's energy coordinator. Huh. And so Paul, of course, is always right. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we pay him the big bucks. Well, that's why we had him here as a guest, too. <laughs> And the final thing here, before we before we go off to to uh, microhydro, is President Obama's and this from Biomass Magazine, which will explain the the le the, the the inclination that it's going to. President Obama's fiscal year 2015 calendar proposal was released on March 4th and calls for extending a tax credit for cellulosic biofuels, but puts forward the idea of cutting billions in fossil fuel subsidies. Well, I can see cutting fossil fuel subsidies regardless of what you're doing with the money. But I think, I think, uh, I think uh, biofuels is probably a good place to go. So that is the week's news. That, is, that was the week that was. That was the week that was. That's, that's a, right. That's a trademark. So, watch it. Uh, yeah, I better do that. That's right. That <laughs> wasn't the title. That, was that wasn't the right? title, guys. That was, that was uh, uh, just a statement. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, James and, and Jeffrey, what about, what about microhydro? What is microhydro? How does it? Let's, let's do this. How does microhydro differ from other hydro? Sure. Why would we want a dam in our backyard? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, if, if you'd bear with us for a couple of minutes just to go through something that we, can I take control here? You can try. <laughs> uh, something that we um, presented some time ago to folks in the legislature. Um, just a little a brief presentation, because I think uh, a picture is probably worth a thousand words here. Uh, if I can see which one this is. Uh, there we go. You're on deck, so it looks like it. So, ah, there you um, go. So, <clears throat> yeah, we did this uh, two years ago, actually, to legislators. And the reason why, I'm, I wish it was cutting off there, but that's okay. Uh, Microhydro is, is a very small citizen accessible technology. We're not talking industrial scale. And I'll note that while there's a lot of interest in, and there's a lot of uptake in solar, I think some of those big numbers are for some of these industrial-sized solar farms. And clearly, there are people putting up solar and have. But <clears throat> here's what people think about. That's Hoover Dam. When, yes, it is. When people think about hydro, this is what they think of, which is the American icon. And then we talk about small hydro, and this is actually um, the Moortown Dam on the Mad River in Vermont. And you can see that that's the same exact idea as the Hoover Dam. It's just smaller and it's more manageable, but there are serious environmental impacts. Could I as ask? A trout fishermen, I could tell you that. Yeah. Can fish go just, over? Can, just back this up can fish can. go backwards over that dam? Um, is there a fish ladder there? Is there some dams, and uh, nowadays uh, there has been monies over the last 20 years uh, for fish ladders, et cetera. But I don't know in this particular one if one okay. has been installed. Okay. Uh, but there but are they would some. not be able just to swim up the water there. I think that's too much. 
Yeah. And clearly when these dams were originally erected, I don't know the exact date on these, but let's say in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, there was absolutely no thought given to environmental impacts, namely fish, but there's many others. And so we have that legacy that hydro caused, you know, we had a lot of power, cheap power from hydro, but we had a lot of environmental damage from hydro. And so people over time thought, you know, hydro's good, but boy, it really has this problem. And I like to fish and I like to have things be, you know, environmentally happy. Um, and hydro is not consistent with that. Mm -hmm. And it's true. What we call large scale um, uh, legacy hydro, Big Hoover dams, yeah. Tennessee Valley Authority, Columbia River, Vernon Dam, the Moore Dam, all the dams in the Connecticut River. We're not building any more of those. In fact, we're tearing them down because a lot of them are getting old and decrepit. And I don't see us in the United States doing that because the impacts are huge. Sad to say that the rest of the world is. And as I said, um, China's Three Gorges will be the largest hydroelectric installation on the planet, um, a thousand times bigger than the Hoover Dam. Um, <clears throat> but this is what's called small scale hydro, which actually my associate Jeff has worked for many, many years in Southeast Asia, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but it also has impacts if not done right. But <clears throat> what we do with Little Green Hydro <laughs> is something called micro hydro. And that is a tape measure that's actually about 16 inches long. And the next time we're on the show, I'm going to bring um, one of these little boxes right here. And this is a stainless steel box. We don't have a dam. I'm oh, sorry, this is advancing. We don't have a dam. We don't use bulldozers. We don't do anything like that. And this little box has a very benign passive ability to collect a certain amount of water, which then passes it into a pipe, a small pipe, which then uses the unlimited renewable energy called gravity <laughs> to produce electricity. Well, yeah. I'm glad you put that tape measure there. Yeah. It gives you the sense of scale. I mean, I right. would have thought it was much bigger. Well, and, but if you look at that, I mean, you don't even have to see that there's a tape measure there. Somewhere here I've got one. That, there you go. There's the bread you can, box. You can see that there's drops of water at the bottom of that. That's a small stream. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that a person could, that looks like a stream that's small enough that you, I, I don't see the tape measure, but the stream. It's not in this picture. Uh, I, yeah. After we get this done, I'll show you You can step right over that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That in there. But you see that little thing in the upper right-hand corner? Yes. That's the proverbial bread box and okay. that's the size that the thing next to it yeah the stainless steel there yeah right there that is actually about this big and that is our intake unit okay our folks are not seeing what this big is but it's yeah, the size of a bread box size of a bread box <laughs> right um and actually just go through a couple of these things these are the pipes we use and this is how an intake works and they look like pipes that you'd buy in the local hardware store. yes they do and this is actually a turbine and that is a powerhouse, and it works wonderfully in the winter. Now let me go and show you uh, an actual video of... Winter operation? Well, I'll show the brook first. Okay. And here's that brook. Oops, sorry. Now, the noise that you're hearing is the water bubbling in the brook. There's no... There's no... Um, the building's not falling down. What's that? The building's not falling down. Yeah, the building is not <laughs> falling down. This noise is not some kind of industrial Here equipment turning. That's just the water flowing over this little unit. And you can see by the, by the picture here, the size of the leaves and things like that, that's really a tiny, tiny unit that's sitting there. And that is a tiny brook. And we have tens of thousands of those in northern New England running down hills. Um, most of them are spring fed. Uh, we have enormous aquifers and what our system needs to operate is water running down hills. We don't have dams. We don't use bulldozers, as I said before. And it doesn't work on big rivers like the Connecticut River because there is no what we call hydraulic head. That means water running down a hill. 
Yeah. And I'll show now you. that unit, before you change it, a fish could actually swim up over Oh yeah, there. up and down, absolutely. So if it was in an area where fish were swimming, they would just do it. And in most of these, uh, there's water that goes, like you see, there's water going around it as well on the left there. This is actually a dry time of this brook, but um, most of the time the way we install it, get this to stop, I guess I can. <laughs> in a practical okay. sense, what we just saw, how much benefit to the owner would that, Yeah. In, in it, without numbers, you know, well, how, or maybe how many light bulbs would it pump? Would it sure, run? well, I think, go it's ahead, like Jeff. It's a kilowatt, you, right? That you, one? That kilowatt? one would run about 25 kilowatt hours. Okay, yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean you, something like that, um, you won't run your electric stove, because that's yeah. electric stove, seven, eight kilowatts. Um, you could put something in to run your electric stove, but a system like that would, um, would, turn, would run all the lights in your house. Yeah. So you could do, Different discrete loads, or if you just want to equate the output to something, um, you know, you could run all your all your light bulbs, provided of course they were efficient light bulbs, things like that. So basically, discrete you things. could live off it, and if you wanted to run the stove, or if you wanted to run, dry a load of wash or something like that, you'd have to turn on an auxiliary. Well, generator. you know, this reminds me of where sure. I was living in New Hampshire yep. Yep. Uh, 25 years ago. I had CFLs in all my light sockets, which wow, everybody thought was really ahead of time. whoa. People <laughs> thought that was the strangest thing they'd ever heard of. But but I had a I, the cooking was done on a wood stove, mm -hmm. a wood cooking range, which by the way produced practically no creosote at all because it was always burning with a really hot fire. But um, dry seasoned wood, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> and you know I mean I mean the, the the electrical use of that house was CFLs mm -hmm. and a computer. Yeah, right. And a television. To, to answer your question specifically. Um, if you want to flip to this, we have a project that we did recently for a very large dairy farm in central Vermont. And um, I don't know if you can show the picture, but this is part of a heifer barn where there are about 300 heifer cows. This is a very large dairy farm, uh, milks about 400 to 500 cows. But we power the entire heifer barn, which is the former um, main dairy farm. Uh, with a microhydro system just like what you saw. A single a system. A single system. One system. It has a very good hydraulic head of about 200 feet, uh, which means from a high point to a low point on this very small brook, there's about 200 feet of drop. And that gravity... That's a lot. That's right. But it's over about um, 2,000 feet of run. So it's actually high pastures that just kind of gradually come down. There's no uh. mountain. And the penstock over that run of 2,000 feet pressurizes the water, which is then converted to energy. And the entire barn is powered entirely by microhydro. And in fact, the way we install it, as you said, if they have an unusual need for electricity, the system will automatically cut over when it senses that it needs it, and it pulls GMP power for them which, by the way, cost them twice as much per kilowatt hour as from the microhydro system. So they're saving a lot of money with they this. They save about $500 every month using this system. And this kind of an application, is sort of the, the microhydro tied to a specific activity, commercial activity. Is it's actually, dedicated. Yeah, dedicated, you yeah. Know, however you want to phrase it. Um, is actually very common in the Himalayas, where you'll have somebody that, that has a business opportunity, be it making paper or something else, they'll bring in a uh, microhydro so they can set it up and run their operations there. It's that cost effective. Here, it's of course a different market, but, but the, the numbers in terms of, of electricity price, uh, they're, they're so much lower than the grid right now that, that this is a viable economic uh, option with no subsidies involved in that sense. So it's, it's really, truly less expensive. Very good point. Yeah. Let me just go to what you said before, George, on the $24 million. Microhydro sites, I'm sure, abound in the Brattleboro area. It would be very easy for me to imagine a town building, maybe not a Brattleboro, but think of a smaller town, you know, Dummerston, uh, maybe the town clerk in the garage, and instead of having a power bill, they have free carbon neutral renewable energy from a microhydro system. And they have the grid if they needed it, yeah. but they would power their, themselves independently 
and it's also highly reliable. It works. There's no cloud. And 20 days. degrees below zero. And that, that well, 20 degrees yeah. below zero. Yes. People want to know. They how clued does it me work? in in advance, folks. I this wasn't a guess. <laughs> how does it work? And that's the wrong. Uh, but maybe to quick, while you look at that, I'll go back yeah. to a quick point. Like what's it. the difference of micro hydro? Um, I think it, the the fundamental difference is is that it's not impounding. You know, the dams that were shown earlier, the, the Hoover and the smaller one there, they impound. They block the water, and that's where the damage comes from siltation mm -hmm. and, and you know lack of of uh, paths for fish and stuff like that. Microhydro is generally speaking what's called run of river. So the little bit's taken out, it's used, it's put back, the main flow keeps going. So you, you basically mitigate the issues that come with impounding by not impounding, by just off taking some, using it, and putting it back. And I think that's really a much more environmentally sustainable way to build power. Um, it is, it's, it's, for small power, it's really the way it's going in the rest of the world. Is, it, is it, it does not widen the river at any given point. No, no, you don't have to worry about agricultural land being given up or your lawn being not, given up. Particularly with this scale and, and the very clever intake that, that, that James and Bob have, have come up with is a very clever intake. Um, that, that sort of automatic, um, how do you phrase Coanda it? effect, where it's self-cleaning. Uh, Coanda effect is something that came from, I believe it was a Hungarian scientist in the 19th century, and it's the same principle that an airfoil on was from aero, uh, from planes, um, why a plane will fly and goes up. When the water runs over the screen, a certain amount of it is guided in through those wedge wires by the flow. Um, I'm not one of the engineers of the smart people, but I know enough that it works. <laughs> and it doesn't have any environmental impact at all. Um, and it's self-maintaining. Um, it's beautiful. And we'd love people to come take a look at any of these sites any time. Um, and I think just to add maybe a crucial point on, on this particular intake, it, it always assures through its design that the stream course that it's in has a minimum flow, always, mm -hmm. because the priority is for the minimum flow over the system. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you, you're going to always have this minimum flow of water. So once you've determined that safe level um, in, in a stream, then there's really no further environmental impact that you have to worry about because it'll always maintain that. So if the stream goes dry, it would have gone dry anyway. It would have gone dry anyways. And if the stream is, is going dry, the first thing to be sacrificed is not the stream, it's the hydropower. Just the power. Stream. Which is okay because you can get your yeah. power from yeah. Green Mountain Power if you have to. You have to. Or from yeah. solar or from because or from that's solar. the summer when it's dry. Yeah. And I noticed that those uh, Wisconsin ones were specifically for peaking. And it's, it's interesting to me that now in Vermont, our peaking is actually summer because of air conditioning. But when you need solar the most in the summer, it's the best. We got it. And hydro <laughs> actually is the weakest then. Hydro is the strongest when solar is the weakest, the fall and the winter. Mm -hmm. Right. So they make a wonderfully seasonally uh, let's balanced. Let's look at this picture. Yeah, go sh show this. This is, this is the, uh, actually we call it the power unit. And this is a little box about three feet by three feet. Turn the sound up so everybody yeah. can hear how loud this is. <laughs> yeah. And this is running in the snow. This is actually at the farm in, in Randolph, Vermont. This is their power unit. And um, that's basically how it operates. You can hear that humming. And here I thought that was a, an aeolian flute blowing. <laughs> Do you know what an aeolian You're flute great. is? <laughs> yes, sort of. <laughs> it's a flute that blows because the wind is blowing. You know, <laughs> it's like a wind chime. This is, this is something that I think probably most of the wildlife out there in the woods would, would not object to. No. no. We get moose tracks around it all the time. <laughs> come up with a white noise generator. Yeah, this would be white noise hydro. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people's question is, well, gee, water freezes in the winter, how does it work? And the answer is, flowing water in a pipe, when it's properly, our product, the EcoHydro system, properly engineered, designed, and installed, runs all the time. And it, except if there's no water in the brook, sometimes in droughts in the summer. Um, as Jeff made reference, and I think we've probably seen that enough at this point, um, made reference, uh, to this, and I'll maybe put up some slides that you know will circulate around while I talk. Um, you know, it, um, it it's something that is citizen accessible. It's not expensive, and it can be the least cost renewable energy. Here you see a couple of young helpers carrying parts. Where did it go? Oh, it's, I think it's <laughs> going to start in a minute. You, oh, here we you, go. You put ones on that you want. That's actually going into the barn at the 
And here's some batteries that we use in the system because we have our own local cache of power. That is. And, uh, Car batteries. Yeah, we use pretty much standard old batteries. Uh, they're, they're good quality. Uh, this is actually the farm project, some of it in process. And uh, yeah, that's actually where it is. Um, so this is just some random photographs we have. You saw that one of the cows. Who are very curious about what you're doing. Yes, they were. They wanted to know. <laughs> they're, they're and here's our they electronics are. and one of our electronics engineers, John, configuring the system. It goes right next to your service panel and just works with everything. And here are some of the screens being fabricated in Bob's factory. Um, there's the power unit in the winter um, sitting there with one of the installers. Oh, here's another one with some, some water running in a brook. The yes. sound again is the water in Sorry. the brook. It's not a, it's not a mechanical device. It's the natural just sound of the water. That's that same brook in the yeah. summertime. Yeah. And so that was, that was that. I don't know. This for all intents and purposes invisible. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it, it strikes me as the kind of thing that you could walk down a stream and not realize that you're walking no, next you to a hydro even know site. No, you wouldn't know. You know. And and I asked earlier about how small an animal would have to oh, be. Oh yeah. To there's get the pig stock at the farm. Sorry. Is that buried? Yes, that's okay. buried. Actually, at their there site, they had a tractor, and he did it himself. And it was deeper than we'd want. But normally, we use something called a ditch witch. Those are the power mm -hmm. cables coming up from the power unit. And that's, that's how he did it with his tractor backhoe I did that a couple my, of days. Did, I did that there's, myself there's once the by hand with a shovel. Trench. Yeah. Uh. Um, First and last time. And this is actually inside well. the power unit working. Anyway, we could, we could talk about and show these pictures. This is that little box that yeah, we just is, saw. Th this is what the box looks like with its top off. Yeah. And that's you an see interesting thing. Somebody's hand there, you give you some idea of how and big that box is. Well, it just that's look at the built. valve. Yeah. You know, yeah. These things are not big. Very unintimidating. Yeah. That's the entire unit. It's uh, 40 inches by 30 inches. And how, there's actually with the cover off running. How much power is this unit generating? That's generating typically about 20 kilowatt hours a day, uh, which is, you know, you, I mean, it's enough to run a, a, a 120 foot barn with 300 heifer um, cows in it. And what it's doing for the barn is lighting? Yes, primarily Anything else? lighting. Primarily fans. Lighting. Fans, okay. Exhaust fans, lighting, incidental electricity. It actually is also running their goat barn and the water heaters. Do they? They're now doing goats as well, uh, raising goats. Do they play music to the cows? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. <laughs> I mean, when I was a kid, I, I, I lived in a place where we'd occasionally see a cow looking in the kitchen window. <laughs> <laughs> and they like music. They really love music. <laughs> Uh, these are our electronics. This is the components that get installed. Um, these pictures will go on forever, and I think that was it. I was going to ask. There's the box. Yeah, there's the The, box. the screen intake. I had asked you earlier about how small an animal would have to be to get yeah. caught in that, in that uh, screen. No animal could, could really get caught in that at all. Um, clearly, um, you know, stuff that's bacterial level and cellular level could go through that. Um, it has no, as we have a research um, environmental biologist who's an academic on the team, and her comment is there's no impact on macroinvertebrate life. Yes, in okay. In the riverine environment. So, you know, we're fairly comfortable that the, um, there, there are no water quality environment uh, impacts. Um, no fish, of course. These are used well, for fish. One of the, one of the things so. that I had thought about, you said that the, it, it might be as small as a half a millimeter. The, yeah, could And be. we had, um, in our greenhouse, we have big tanks. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, golden shiners, among other okay. uh, things, in those tanks. Eat the algae and, and things? Last, yeah. Okay. And last year, they decided to have babies. So okay. we had baby golden shiners in there, which look kind of like an eyelash with a pair of eyes at one end. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they're so small. But they're about an eighth of an inch long. Mm. And, and a half a millimeter is very small compared to, a half, to an eighth of an inch. And fish, of course, always want to swim against the current. So a small fish like that would just pass, just the tiniest fish you can imagine would probably just pass over the thing. It would pass through, uh, but honestly, many of these intakes 
are in locations, for example, in that particular brook, where there wouldn't it would be, be any fish. above the fishery. Yeah. Now, the fishery is going to be further down. Yeah. Um, and they will be spawning below that, where it's a second order. This is a first order brook, meaning it comes from sources out of the ground. Okay. A second order brook would have other brooks feeding into it. Okay. A second order brook would have more water, and when we install the intake unit, chances are it'll be wider and there'll be areas where it wouldn't be the main channel of the brook. Mm -hmm. We put this in by hand and we locate it in such a way that you know, it's not going to provide, the scientific wording is, no upstream downstream barrier. So there's nothing that prevents macroinvertebrate or fish life from moving. And you know, the, the, the challenge for us is that this is a very citizen accessible, energy independent, economically viable, and environmental sustainable technology that's inexpensive. But today, if you as a citizen, and many people contact us and say, gee, I'd like to do microhydro, but I went to the state of Vermont and they sent me 40 pounds of paper. <laughs> and I don't know what to do with it. Well, burn it. I had, get, I had to get a lawyer, and then they told me to hire a consultant. And the unfortunate reality is you really cannot do microhydro with today's regulation. Not because the regulation is bad, but because it's behind the times. The regulation that we have today in Vermont and almost every state, certainly in New Hampshire as well, is meant for the Hoover Dam and the mm -hmm. Moore Dam mm -hmm. and the Vernon Dam. And it's certainly needed. And um, it, it, it was, should have been there in the first place. But the problem is it was in an era when electricity cost one-tenth of one cent a kilowatt hour in 1961. And nobody thought about climate change. And nobody thought about grid instabilities. And we weren't living in a world of renewables. And unfortunately, the government regulation has not kept pace. So that if you were to want to install microhydro today, let's say the system cost fifteen or $20,000 for you to install, it would probably cost you $50,000 in permitting with consultants and environmental impact studies and lawyers and hearings. And we think that that doesn't make a lot of sense in a climate change world that just like wind farm sightings and solar sightings and gas pipe, all kinds of things, that there need to be intelligent decisions made. And we're really, really happy that last year, um, a wonderful legislator, Margaret Cheney of Norwich, uh, was thoughtful and far thinking enough to introduce the very first microhydro bill in the country into the Vermont legislature. And this bill would set the legislature's stamp to the regulators saying microhydro can be a very important small distributed citizen accessible technology for our citizens and we want you the regulators to look at ways that are environmentally sustainable to regulate this and we want you to create a pilot for several years and there'll be academics and researchers and use best environmental practices to show how this can actually produce clean, cost-effective, least cost renewable power in Vermont. And we're very hopeful that this bill will move along this year and that Governor Shumlin would sign it. And it doesn't take any state monies to do this. It's not, there's no subsidies. Hydro doesn't get any subsidies like other renewables, nor do we need them uh, because we have the renewable energy in the state of Vermont that we could be using locally and not sending the money for wind turbines or solar panel, pa panel manufacturer to China. We could be building these very low cost units with green jobs and we're very excited about it. We are the first micro hydro company uh, producing a product, the eco hydro system, that we provide the entire solution including the permitting and dealing with the state of Vermont and New Hampshire. And it's slow, but we're positive about it. And we've got some great experiences. And we hope that more towns and farms and small businesses would consider, if they have a brook running in their area, that microhydro 
could be something for them to look at. Well, James, I'd, I'd, I want to have you back on another program, and we can talk about specifics, both in terms of the legislature and in, 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 uh, in terms of um, uh, spe specific projects, for we'll, example. We'll bring you some things. Too. Yeah, we'll right. We'll bring you some real I'm thinking it would, be, it would be really nice to have specific figures <laughs> on, on, on the Whetstone okay. Brook. I okay. mean, uh, Tom right here, brought up that thing about about the thing in Brattleboro. Could the town, mm -hmm. um, could the town get an electric power system in, yes. or a series of them? Yes, that, multiple. That, yeah, that would that would be uh, because this this strikes me as being really as close to a no-brainer as as you can get. <laughs> I'm really glad you say that. Well, it, it, there's as far as I can see, and of course, you know, being a guy who watches eighth of an inch long fish <laughs> <laughs> swimming around in the roots of a of a water hyacinth plant, um, it, it looks to me like there's no negative impact that I could that I could imagine out of this. Well, as as Jeff said correctly, the only and this is. You know, state of Vermont regulators and state of New Hampshire regulators, environmental regulators, that is, un agree. Our technology has no environmental impacts to water quality or any contamination issues. The only issue is how much water do we leave in the brook for fish and macroinvertebrate life? And we're happy to say that we invented a, a feature in the intake unit that, as Jeff correctly said, if you're in a drought, and we've had them in the last few years. What happens is the hydropower starts diminishing because the intake takes less water from the brook because there's always water that you saw that water flowing over the screen. Mm -hmm. There's a minimum that's guaranteed to flow over. And at such a point that there's not enough, the hydro starves and shuts down. And all the water that's there stays in the brook. And we can't change what Mother Nature does. But we can assure that when there are critical water levels, that it always feeds the environment first. And the way we configure our system, then you'd have to pull grid power, or you'd have to use your solar uh, system, which okay. would be very strong in July and August. Well, thank you. Um, I noticed that we are at the end of our hour. Okay. So I want to <laughs> thank you for, for, for the coming and listening to me talk about the news for That's as great. long as you did. I love it. <laughs> But I do want to have you back, and we can talk more about this. We'll come. So um, for those who have been watching us uh, on, tel on, the, on the broadcast for BCTV, we'll see you again. Or you will see us, because we don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I saw a picture many, many years ago of a, of a turbine that was, um, it was in Switzerland. And uh, it was a... It was a it was a it was a turbine that was driven by a head of, I think, 2,500 feet, which is just about double what the difference between Brattleboro and Marlboro is, you know, in the in the course of the Whetstone Brook. But that turbine was about six feet in diameter, and it was about I'm going to guess 18 inches wide, and it was so it was the kind of thing that a person could fit in his barn, or his his garage. It was much smaller than a car. I don't know that it, it might have been too heavy to put into a pickup truck because just the weight of it. But it was 60,000 horsepower. I can't, I can't conceive of 60,000 horsepower. Yeah, I know. I mean, here, that's here, un, enough here to drive a on, ship. On this screen here is that uh, PowerPoint. See if you recognize it. I'm going to have to put my glasses on. Yeah, that might help. I'm sorry about looking foolish with my glasses on. But that's what I do for a living. I look foolish. <laughs> <laughs> well, take a look at the screen there. See if it's something you recognize there. Oil demand is weak. GDP growth is en endogenously weak. Well, it's starting off saying, oh, it's probably not on, on it's the not screen. not on the yet. screen. Oil companies cut back in, on spending. Oh, yes. And they it's did. The assumptions of demand constrained forecasting. And this is the forecasting. So we're no longer on micro hydro, but we are on oil companies, and this is this is something that was on your blog, and I yes. just took, I just took it down uh, kind of verbatim. I just yeah there was there was text went along with this, but this yeah. is just the PowerPoint. This is not too. my this is not my material. It's material I put up. Material you put up. Yeah, on that's there. why I don't remember it. 
You want to take a look at it and put it up there? Sure, let's let's put a, put it, uh, take a look at it. The beginning of the end, oil companies cut back on spending. Now, you know, um, Shell Oil has done this. Shell Oil was into fracking, getting oil uh, from, the, from the fields in the United States and Canada. And they had a bunch of big plans, and they have stopped... Um, they, ha they have stopped exploration, they have stopped drilling, they have stopped uh, uh, projects that they had. They had a multi-billion dollar uh, gas to, to liquid fuel conversion uh, plant planned for Louisiana. That has, has been, the plug's been pulled on that one. They've gotten out of the Arctic. They've got out of the Arctic. They have sold their fracking um, uh, leases and options. And they have also announced, separately of, from all of this, that they're starting to invest heavily in renewable power. And mm -hmm. they are not the only ones who have done it. And here we're, we're talking about a more generic uh, group. I know that Chesapeake, which is the second largest fracking operation in the United States, has also pulled out of fracking. And again, the reason is because it is just too expensive and it's not delivering what they had hoped it would. It is a, well... So what do, you, what do you want to say about this, Tom? I know well, that you have... I, I haven't really studied it to say anything, but yeah. other than to read it, and the people that are watching it can read it, but yeah. this Demand is the sweet. assumptions that they have made in these forecasts. And forecasts are saying that uh, things don't look good as far as an investment is concerned. Yeah. So well, the second page is, uh, this, this is a little bit historical. They call it the motorization and oil and historical content uh, as the world became more motorized. Now, what, we, what is the most left-hand figure there? Is that 1980? It's hard for me uh, to 19... read it. 1960. 60, okay. 1960. So what we're seeing there is a huge increase. This is, this is from production. 19, okay, from 1960, and then it drops off for the gas crisis. It flattened it, out. Yeah. Increased slightly after the gas crisis, but not on the same kind of um, uh, slope. And for the for the graph, and then it dropped again. So they're saying at the very end, based upon precedent, anticipated growth would be 2.7 percent a year. The growth in demand. Uh huh. Not 0.8 percent, which is what they had been saying. So okay. there's much more demand for oil than they were figuring because of places like India and China. Mm -hmm. But... And this is more uh, more local. It's uh, driving versus employment. And since there's fewer people employed, there's less driving and less demand for oil. Yes. No car, no job. And it's, this is something I just heard on the radio today. Uh, the kids aren't driving as much. Yeah. And part of that is because a lot of people aren't... Uh, employed but it's the way the, the the commentary i guess it was bill press was talking about it so when i was 14 i couldn't wait till i had a car yeah he said now the kids don't seem to care yeah <laughs> they're 50, 25 years old they, they don't even want a car that's right no car no job only 19 percent of persons age 18 to 39 without a driver's license hold a full-time job and wow. unemployment is 80 percent of the reasons why young people are driving less yeah, this is uh, CapEx is a capability. I'm not sure exactly what CapEx. Capability of expansion. I, capability of expansion, I think it is, versus crude oil production. So crude oil production is going down, but the uh, capability, their need, basically, is going up. Uh, that looks like it is a price. That, it is in upward. billions of dollars. Oh, man. And crude oil production is in uh, barrels or millions of garrels, barrels. So the price, what they're saying is the price is going up and up. Well, here's, here's a little more. Uh, we should have practiced this one. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't really analyze this one. I didn't spend a lot of time looking at it. I just put it up so people could see it. But... Um, productivity has fallen by a factor of five since 2000. 
Oil production has faltered. Observed decline trend is now approach, approaching 5% per year. That is, a, that is a trend in decline, and a 5% per year decline is heavy duty. Yeah, it is. It's a heavy duty decline. And, and the demand is going up. And one of the things that's, well, the demand is going up, but, you know, that, that's something that's not, that can't be sustained. CapEx is capital expenditure. Okay. So what they have to spend to get that oil out is going up. And the amount of oil that's coming out is going down. That is, uh, they're, they're in trouble. They're that's absolutely in trouble. Here. And, you know, the message that I would have to people who are viewers and to friends and to relatives and to anybody that I can reach is you need, and you know, I mean, I write about this in Green Energy Times and stuff like that. We, you need to, you need, you need to be resilient and you need to think about the resilience. Now here's, this is not the, something that's gonna happen automatically. They explain automatically. this a little bit more here. The upstream spends, which is what they're calling CapEx. Okay. Ca capital expenditure. Yes. How much money they're spending. Yes. It's risen strongly in the last decade with industry expectations only six months ago for continued strong gains. But the that hasn't happened. The costs are rising fast. Yeah. That's the message there. Profits have lagged because costs are rising faster than revenues. The oil prices have been largely flat. Now you see, this is the reason why a company like Shell would be pulling out of exploration and drilling abandoning its Arctic uh, drilling sites, abandoning fracking, abandoning whatever, because they're, they're seeing a situation where as they put more money in, they're, they're getting, getting less, less out. out. Yep. And at some point you have to pull the plug on that. A now, number of projects have been deferred, canceled, or returned for reevaluation. Yeah, and so what I'm seeing is an oil industry in which the industry wants us to believe that if we're going to buy a furnace, oil's good, natural gas is good. They want us to believe that because they want to continue selling us oil and natural gas into the future. But in, in point of fact, I don't think that's the case. I think they know that it's not a good investment to, to get, a, get a furnace that's dependent on oil or natural gas, particularly in light of the fact that we've got the ability to have heat pumps instead of instead instead of those furnaces and they're far far cheaper already mm -hmm. I know. think the day will come where burning something to get to gain the heat out of it will be looked upon as primitive I think it is primitive yeah. no I mean it, it, it's a it's profitability is down 10 to 20 percent well you know this is a this is a situation that is difficult and it's it's interesting to me that you know, we've got these, um, for example, in the news today, and I didn't put it, uh, put it up here, the um, a committee of members of parliament, what they call MPs in, in the UK, has um, told the Bank of England that they really want to start looking at the, at the whole, you know, this whole question. The whole the whole picture. The whole picture. Instead of just yeah. pieces of it. And, yeah. and it, the kind of the implication of it, and of course the Norwegians are doing this too, is that they, they want to think about not having oil as, as, a, as an investment. The, the Norwegian government is thinking about divesting. And this is not because of college students hanging around saying, you know, no. with posters. This is no, because... This, this is economic. It's, uh, it's decision -making. economic and it's, it's a... It's a we're in a we're in a position here where cha things are changing. It's obvious to people who who know it. It's not obvious to people who don't know it, and it is uh, something that the industry I think is in denial about. What is that picture there? It well, says this is Shell. About Shell. Okay. This is about Shell. Shell says it was dropping its oil and gas production growth targets. Yeah. In a sign of how difficult it is becoming for the super majors to increase output. Yeah. And they're showing the oil price increase is greater than the exploration and production cost. Yes. And Shell is placing sharper focus on fewer projects. Just what you just said. Yeah, how about that? I sound like a prophet, don't and I? And the oil price <laughs> increase is less than the exploration and production cost. So they're not making any money. Yes. And so here's and, Shell. And Shell is not the only company. It's just that they're the one company that they're is. They're the one that's getting the most 
uh, press because press they're the one, who've, who, the one that has talked about the problem. Discontinue production guidance and focus on increased cash flow. That's what they're doing. No yeah, Alaska absolutely. in 2014 and major divestment. Pro just exactly what you talked about. This is, a, this is an oil company that's divesting. Yeah. I mean, just think about that. We've been hearing college students and environmentalists and such what talking about why various college funds and so, you know, scholarship funds should divest. Here and here is an oil company that is divesting in oil. Yep. What does that tell you? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, if, if, I were a, if I were a stock advisor who is, you know, telling people about the stock market, I'd say this is not a good industry to get involved in. It's just, it's just not. And of course, you know, the, the, the uh, Harvard University, they look at it and they say, no, 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 we've got to be making money. And the reason, the reason they're saying these things is because they expect, um, they expect to be able to continue uh, making money on their investments. And I think they're going to get burned. Well, it looks like some of them think so, too. Well, certainly the people in, in uh, Norway, the people at Shell Oil. These are just some headlines. They're just, just repeating the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the... Now, in case anybody is watching this and really wants to know, <laughs> the noise in the background is coming from Roland. <laughs> uh, this one I'd have who, to who by the way, we, 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 should, we should thank profusely for his help because he's extremely helpful. Did you hear that, Roland? <laughs> <laughs> Roland's up in the control room. He doesn't hear what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the summary of the whole thing. Yeah. This this is what we've just been watching. <laughs> these are these are you know this is a wonderful thing, Vlasta. Are you done? No, we're not done. We're just we're still talking, but we talk about people walking through as they walk through, okay. and, and I'm just explaining to everybody how much we appreciate BCTV. <laughs> No, don't apologize. We're doing just fine here. <laughs> okay. At some point, I have to ask you a question, by the way, about how to pronounce a, a name. Well, I'll just read the last three sentences because it okay. says it all. If the supply constrained approach, which is what they've been studying, is right, then GDP growth depends intrinsically on increasing oil production. Wow. Without such increases, the GDP growth will continue to lag indefinitely with long-term GDP growth in a 1 to 2 percent range entirely plausible, indeed likely. That's nothing. 1.2. Well, 1 how, to about, 2%. how about a growth that's negative? Mm -hmm. That's what's called a recession. That's what we're heading for, I think. That's I think that's what we're heading for, and I think part of the reason why that's saying. happening is because the oil industry is, is not owning up to this. Shell isn't even an American company. Oh, no. Royal Dutch Shell. Yeah, exactly. Dutch and British. Yeah. And, and the... Owned by the Rothschilds, the Dutch royal family, English royal family, and a few other people. <laughs> but but you see the point is the 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 you know if if we had if we had corporations that were in that were in, like B corps the benefit corporations mm. running mm. running these things they'd be saying look out guys we've got a problem here you're going to have to start dealing with renewables but instead of doing that they're saying how are we going to protect our assets how are we going to protect our profits if we tell everybody what's going on we're going to be losing money we can't tell everybody what's going on so we we will just deny it. That's basically what, what's happening. I think yeah. I said something just like that early on. Yes. Before we, I think, got Absolutely. Got that's, what we, that's what we've been talking about. I for, think for the a way I time. said was they can't not know what's happening. They can't not know what's happening, exactly. <laughs> but they're telling us otherwise. They're telling us, you know, that they're going to, you know, the, the, the guy who's the CEO of BHP Billiton said coal is going to be ruling the market in 2050. I think it was 2050. It might have been 2035 or 2030, but it isn't. 
And the oil industry, you know, the, the profits of the oil industry are saying fossil fuels are going to be in, in providing the bulk of the power in 2035, 2050. And it's, 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 it's utter nonsense that is intended to keep them in business. I've got one here business. I think I can pull up here. What's that? Oh, look at that. Yes, there you this go. This is a picture show. Oh, my gosh. This is a picture show about North Dakota. Well, let's not go to North Dakota. <laughs> my goodness. We've only got about three minutes, Tom. Well, then this is a, at least a 15-minute presentation. Well, we can save it for some other time. Let's save it for another time. Because it gonna, is an interesting uh, story. I think this is the one we saved last time for yeah, another time. Yeah, we did. Well, I'm very sorry <laughs> about that, folks. But we will have people coming in at about, about uh, noon to use the studio, so... We do have to. That's I think, about 15 minutes here. Yeah. Yeah. I think what we should do, because we're going to have to start packing up before they come in. I think we what we should do is probably um, call it a day. What do you think? I think it's getting to be about that time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to thank everybody for for watching us, and uh, I know that we're feeling very uninspired for the last 10 minutes, but. You know, <laughs> easy. It's it's an easy thing to sit around blaming the oil industry for all potential problems, because they're guilty. <laughs> <laughs>